risen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Happy Easter to you and welcome to Orland Park Christian Reformed Church on this Easter morning. Today we worship the Lord Jesus and celebrate the fact that he is not dead, but he has risen from the dead. He is Lord. He is alive, and he is worthy of worship. Amen? Amen. Let's begin the service by standing and hearing the greeting that comes from our risen Lord. (coughs) Grace and mercy and peace be yours from God the Father and from Christ Jesus the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, here does call to worship from Psalm 57. It says, Awake, my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Let's all say this together. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Amen. Let's sing together.
good to worship the Lord with the people of God and the house of God. Amen. 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 We're going to lift our voices and sing this anthem of praise, of praise to the name above every name. Amen. Let's sing together. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior.
We have the opportunity now to give of our gifts and offerings out of the overflow of the joy and the gratitude that we have for our risen Lord Jesus. Now, kids, ages three through pre-kindergarten, normally you are used to leaving now for children's church um, during the offering. But today you get to stick around a little bit longer because after our choir sings for us during the offering, there's going to be a kid's message right here on the platform. So you all can come on up when the choir is done, and I'll let you know when that's the time to do that. So kids, stay put. Deacons, come on forward, and let's have our offering from the choir.
Well, boys and girls, come on up and find a seat on the platform here behind me. You can take a seat on the risers if you would like. And I have something in this brown bag. And you're not going to know what it is until the very end, okay? So I'm just going to put this on the side over here. So it's a take on the Dan Rota. He starts with it. I'm going to finish with it. It's an homage. Come on up. Hey, Ellie. How are you? Good. You guys are looking great in your wonderful Easter colors. Have a seat. All right, boys and girls. Who's got big plans for today? Anyone going to Grandma and Grandpa's house? Yeah, you are? Are you going to have some really good food at Grandma and Grandpa's house? Yeah. Yeah? Ooh. Oh, you're from Minnesota. Wow. Is it cold there? Yeah. Yeah? yeah pretty cold. Basically still snow. There's still snow? Yeah. It's almost yeah, April. Places with text, text, text. Yeah. And I got this from Easter. Oh, nice. All right. Great Easter. Great Easter. Uh, what do you call that? A, a satchel? Candy. Okay, so here's my next question. Who's done an Easter egg hunt this year, or who's doing one today? Awesome. Did you guys, what do you guys get in your Easter eggs? Chocolate? Yeah, chocolate. What about you guys? Oh, yeah. Oh, you got an Easter egg in your Easter egg. Is there a smaller Easter egg inside of that Easter egg? Oh, that's a big one. Yeah, nice. All right. Okay. <laughs> Those are great. Good for you guys. No, so no money in your Easter eggs? Oh, yeah. Your parents are a little cheap. <laughs> All right. Well, who's going to have who's going to have ham for lunch today? Yeah? Maybe? You don't know. Okay, well, I just want to get you on the topic of food. Because here's my real question for you. Who's ever eaten a resurrection roll? Has anyone ever made a resurrection roll or eaten a resurrection roll? Okay, so you have, Josiah? Yeah, did you have one this morning? Awesome. Okay, so I have a picture on the screen for you guys of what resurrection rolls look like. You can see it there or over there. This is the unfinished product, mind you. Now, resurrection rolls work a little bit like this. We have a marshmallow, and we roll the marshmallow around in melted butter and in cinnamon sugar. And then we take that marshmallow, and we wrap it up in the raw dough from a crescent roll, and then we put it in the oven for 8 to 10 minutes on 375. <laughs> and then, does anyone know what happens to the marshmallow when you bake it in the oven? Exactly. It melts and then you can't see it anymore because when you open the resurrection roll, you take it out of the oven, you cut it open. What does it look like? An empty tomb, right? Yeah, yeah Jesus, empty tomb. That's great. I, I had one of those for, um, breakfast. for breakfast. Oh, at school. Nice. Now, you eat breakfast at school? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so, resurrection rolls. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. I forgot you guys are from Minnesota. You guys do things differently there. <laughs> resurrection rolls help tell us the story of Easter. Now, let me tell you a little bit why. Just like we roll the marshmallow in butter and cinnamon, after Jesus died on the cross, on Friday night, his friends came and they took his body down and they prepared it for burial with oil and spices. Now, just like we wrap the marshmallow in the dough and place it in the oven, Jesus' body was then wrapped in burial clothes, grave clothes, and then placed inside the tomb. And just like we wait while the rolls bake in the oven, Jesus really was dead and he was in the tomb. And his disciples had to wait for three days and they knew he was really dead. But what happened on Easter Sunday morning? That's right, Jesus rose again from the dead. Just like we take the rolls out of the oven and we find them empty, Jesus' disciples went to his tomb on Sunday morning and they found it empty. 
Now what happened? Did Jesus disappear like the marshmallow? No, that's right. Jesus appeared. Jesus appeared to his disciples and then to 500 other people, and they saw him with their own eyes. And guess what? Jesus is still alive right now, and he's in heaven. And someday, you and me, we're going to get to see him with our own eyes too. Sound pretty good? Yeah, awesome. Okay, now, about the bag. If you guys want other ways to make the Easter story come alive, you can take one of these Easter story kits home with you on your way home from church. There's Play-Doh in here, and that's going to get in your house, not, <laughs> not in God's house. So, on your way home, out the door, grab one of those, and you can do all the things you want with it at home. Okay, let me pray for us while our worship team comes back up to lead us in our next song. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this Sunday morning. Thank you for these kids and for your resurrection. Thank you that even something like resurrection rolls can remind us that you are alive and that we will get to see you someday. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, boys and girls, great job. You can go ahead and have a seat. And if you're three to pre-kindergarten, you can go to Children's Church. Let's stand together and sing. In the darkness we will wait without hope, without light, till from heaven.
let's join in prayer together. Lord and giver of life, we rejoice today in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We praise you because Jesus has conquered death, and this has given us a sure and certain hope that we will live forever in your presence. We praise you today, O oh Lord, because Jesus has paid the penalty for our sin so that we can look forward without fear to meeting you, our creator and maker, you who are the judge of the living and the dead. We rejoice today in your goodness as we eagerly await the glories of spring. We thank you for these signs of your power to bring new life. As the grass turns green and as the spring flowers bloom, may our hearts overflow with joy. Fill us with faith in Jesus, whose resurrection guarantees our own glorious resurrection. And if we have suffered some loss, the loss of health or financial security or loved ones, we pray that you would grant us a joyful expectation that we will be made whole. Speed the day, Lord, when all sorrow and sign flee away. Speed the day when the new creation will replace the old. We pray today not just for ourselves. We pray for those who long for that final resurrection and for the new creation more than any of us here ever could. We pray for refugees, for the victims of war, for the survivors of natural disaster, for the abused and exploited. We pray for the homeless and for those disrespected and harmed by prejudice and oppression. We pray for families and communities and nations racked by division and conflict, and we pray for those who are persecuted for their faith. We pray today, O oh Lord, for all who need your help in a special way. We ask that the light of Christ's resurrection may shine on each one and fill their hearts with comfort and hope. Make us, O oh Spirit of God, persons in whom the resurrection life already blazes. May our words and our actions be instruments of your healing grace and peace. May the good news of Jesus break up the hearts that are hard and hardened by sin. We pray for all in our congregation who need your healing grace. We pray for your blessing and help for all who are visiting with us today. We pray for all who need to hear and believe the gospel. May the glorious good news that Christ is risen set the tone for our lives today and every day in the coming week and month and year. All this we pray in the victorious name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Let's take a look at God's word together now. We're going to hear the story from John chapter 20 about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus from the dead. You can turn with me to page 1077 in the Bibles that are provided for you. The words will also be on the screen. Let's hear this most glorious of accounts now of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. John chapter 20, starting at verse 1, reading the whole chapter. Now on the first day of the week... Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Jesus went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? 
She said to them, they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that by believing you may have life in his name. I've called this sermon, Hearing is Believing. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we hear this great story, the most beautiful story in the world, we pray that we would hear and that we would believe and that we would have life in the name of Jesus. We pray that you would work in power and that here, as we hear, as we listen, that we would believe. Oh Lord, work in power now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Seeing is believing. Now, that's probably something you've heard. It's a statement of fact, almost a proverb, really. It's just a reality. We believe things when we see them. What could be more conclusive proof than I saw it happen? Sometimes when it comes to Easter, if you're anything like me, you think, man, if I could just go and actually be there and see the reality of the risen Lord Jesus, I'm certain that all my, do- my doubts would be gone. If I could just go and see. That's me from time to time. I don't think I'm alone. This last week, I was listening to a CD that my children found. For those of you that are uh, under the age of 20, that's an instrument upon which people used to listen to music or other sorts of programs. So my kids found a CD and we put it into our car CD player. If you're under 20, that's what you used to use to play these instruments that you could listen to media on. It turns out it was a CD of a radio program called Adventures in Odyssey. Now I don't know if you've ever listened to Adventures in Odyssey. I grew up listening to that radio program and in this particular program, John Avery Whitaker, 
the proprietor of a shop that children would go and play in, invented a machine called the Imagination Station that through the power of imagination could transport people back in time to experience biblical stories. And one such child, a young boy named Duggar, went into the Imagination Station and was transported into the last week of the life of Jesus. And in seeing the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, he came to believe. Because seeing is believing, right? And in the passage that we just read, one disciple named Thomas believes because Jesus is a gracious and good savior. And appears to him and allows him to see the place where the nails had pierced his hands and the place where the spear had pierced his side. And by seeing, Thomas believes. Seeing is believing. But the message of the whole chapter, you couldn't really describe as seeing is believing. And that might surprise you since the word that's repeated again and again and again is saw or see or looked There's this emphasis on what it is that we can view with our eyes. Instead, John chapter 20 commends something else to us. John chapter 20 actually commends hearing. What I want to argue to you today is that hearing is believing. Specifically, what I want for all of us is that we would hear and believe and have everlasting life in Jesus. That's what I want to talk about briefly today. Hear, believe. And have everlasting life in Jesus. In John chapter 20, there are three main scenes. And each one shows us a little bit uh, of a different perspective about seeing or hearing and believing. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to take a look at those scenes. The first one is the scene that, that sort of follows Mary as she runs to the disciples. And the disciples, as they run from the room where they were at, to an empty tomb. The second scene is Mary as she stands outside of the tomb and encounters Jesus. And the last scene is the disciples and then specifically Thomas as Jesus appears to them in the room where they're staying. And those are the three scenes we're going to work through. And as we work through them, we're going to see what the text says about seeing and about believing. So let's start with scene one, from the room of the disciples to the tomb of Jesus. The passage begins early enough in the morning for it to still be dark. And the focus of the passage real quick is on seeing. The word saw is repeated four times in this first scene. And it begins in verse one. Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb and she sees something. She sees that the stone that had been placed in front of the tomb of the Lord Jesus has been rolled back and rolled away. Now, without going into it, she runs back to the disciples because she figures this is information that they need to know. And immediately upon hearing it, two disciples run to the tomb. We're told the name of one, Peter. We're told the other is the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's the way that John refers to himself in his gospel. John and Peter run to the tomb. It seems like John likes to give Peter a little bit of guff because he can't help but mention the fact that he's a better runner than Peter. Peter and I go to the tomb together. He's uh, obviously much slower than me, and so I beat him to the tomb. I'm thankful that God, in his divine wisdom, inspired this gospel author to just insert this little barb into this friend that he had. So Peter and I ran. Peter, as you all know, very slow. Old Pete falls back. I get to the tomb first. I get to see everything first. He doesn't go into the tomb. He looks in and sees the linen cloths there, the cloths that had been used to wrap the body of Jesus, no longer containing the body of Jesus. After time enough, Peter shows up, lumbering into the scene, and Peter, ever the disciple to just jump into things, he doesn't hang around the outside, he goes right into the tomb to figure out what's going on, and he sees something also, the very same thing that John had seen, linen cloths no longer wrapping the body of the Lord Jesus, the body is gone. In the court system of Israel at this particular time, the testimony of two men who agreed was enough to convict or acquit. This testimony of two witnesses was good enough to stand in court. Jesus is not in the tomb. As the text here in the first few verses continues to talk about seeing, the emphasis is actually on what they don't see. 
The point is that Jesus is not in the tomb. The point is as they run to the tomb and look in and then go in and look, they realize the body is gone. Jesus is not there. And the most intense punctuation of this reality is that as John arrives at the tomb, he looks in, doesn't go in, he looks and sees the linen cloth. Then Peter goes in and sees the the fact that they're separate from each other, that the, the head scarf is all folded up so there's something intentional about this it's not an act that happened quickly and then John goes in and we're told that he saw and he believed did you see that he saw verse 8 then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first just had to mention that again one more time also went in and he saw and believed It's actually seeing the absence of God, the absence of Jesus that causes him to believe. It's interesting because verse 9 says, For yet they did not understand the scripture from the scripture that he must rise from the dead. As As John walks into the tomb, he has this sudden intuition that Jesus is alive and he believes. This is before he even understood from the scriptures that it had to happen this way before Jesus or any other disciple could show, could explain from the entirety of the Bible that it had to happen this way before he had a comprehension that the whole book from Genesis until now was all about the fact that Jesus was going to come to earth and die, but he wouldn't stay dead. He would rise again from the dead. It's before he even put together the people pieces that were there all along, he nonetheless realizes Jesus is not here. I believe in him. He sees the fact that Jesus isn't there and he believes. You know, if you and I are to believe this morning, it will be in the same way. It will be in recognizing that we don't see Jesus right now. And it will be by realizing that the reason that we don't see him is that he has risen from the dead, that he is not here, that he has ascended into heaven, that he sits at the right hand of the Father, that he will return in glory to judge the living and the dead. If you and I are to believe this morning, it will be by realizing that he is not here, he is risen that he is Lord, that he will return. And then the camera, so to speak, as the narrator describes things, kind of follows John and Peter as they go back to the place where the disciples are staying. And then the scene cuts back to a different person standing outside the tomb. Our second scene, Mary, as yet, does not believe like John does. She believes that Jesus is still dead. And her burden is deepened terribly because she believes that not only has Jesus lost his life, but she believes that she has lost his body, that she's without even his body. And a series of astounding things happen next in this second scene of the passage. The first is that as she now looks into the tomb, the tomb that John and Peter had just testified was empty, she sees that there are two angels in the tomb. And yet Mary is so overcome with grief that she doesn't stop her weeping. And as they speak to her, she replies in a pretty matter-of-fact way. This is only one of a few instances in Scripture where somebody encounters an angel, much less two, and is not overcome with terror and awe. Instead, she keeps on weeping, and when they ask her why it is that she's crying, she refers to an unspecified they. They they took him. I don't know where they put him. She can't imagine that Jesus is alive again. She assumes it must have been some sinister power that rolled the stone away, that removed the guards and decided to perform a profane and disgusting prank. And all the while, unbeknownst to her, Jesus has approached the tomb and is standing behind her and she turns 
and she sees him, her redeemer, her rabbi. She sees Jesus. And yet, seeing is not believing at first for Mary. She sees him and mistakes him for the gardener. She thinks that maybe he's the one that's stolen the body of Jesus away. And she speaks to him in something of an accusatory sort of manner. Hey, if you were the one that did this, just tell me where you put him. I'll fix it. There's a fair bit of suspicion in all of that. Was it you? Were you the one who did this? Are you behind this morbid prank? If so, I can remedy it. Now, isn't this interesting? That she sees Jesus and she doesn't actually get it. She doesn't know it's him. She doesn't see it and then believe. This isn't actually the only place where that happens. On the road to Emmaus, recorded in Luke chapter 24, there are two disciples that are walking, going back to their home, and Jesus walks along with them, and they don't get it. They look at him and they don't understand that it's Jesus who's been raised from the dead. Seeing for them is not believing at first. You might think that if you were to go back in time and see the risen Lord Jesus with your own eyes, that seeing would be believing. That all your skepticism might wash away. That you'd be like that kid at Adventures in Odyssey. Seeing would be enough. In Isaiah, we're told that Jesus had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. There was nothing in his form that we should desire him. It may be. As surprising as this is, it may be that if we were to go back and see with our own eyes that we actually wouldn't get it. That seeing wouldn't necessarily be a benefit. You might be like Mary. You might be like the Emmaus Road disciples. You might see and not perceive because Mary doesn't get it until something particular happens. She doesn't get it until Jesus speaks her name. Mary. And when she hears her name spoken, that's when she understands. For Mary, hearing is believing. The Lord God says this about his own in Isaiah chapter 43. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. If you and I are to believe this morning, it will be in the way that Mary does. Through having ears tuned to the voice of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Through having the kind of ears of faith who are which are able to hear the risen Lord Jesus speak your name and realize you've redeemed me. I'm yours. There's a third scene. And in the third scene, seeing actually is believing. At the end of the passage, first the disciples and then Thomas are able to see the risen Lord. And by seeing, they believe. Thomas isn't there the first time Jesus shows up in the room where the disciples are staying. And so as they tell him about it, as he hears about the fact that Jesus is alive, that he's been raised from the dead, Thomas refuses to believe it. No, I've got to see with my own eyes. I've got to hold on to his hands with my hands. I've got to be able to put my finger into the torn flesh of his hands that the nails created as he was put on the cross. That's what Thomas says is required for him to believe. And in this story, Jesus is so gracious and kind. 
In the Gospel of John, actually, he's so gracious to Thomas. And so Jesus comes back to be with his disciples and he says, hey, Thomas, you can see. You can actually put your finger in the nail holes, Thomas. You can stop your unbelief and you can believe. And for Thomas, seeing is believing and it's beautiful because in seeing Jesus, he gives this clear description of the nature of our Savior. He looks at him. Do you see what he says? Thomas answered him in verse 28. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Thomas gets it right. Having seen, he believes. And yet, Jesus has another word. All right, Thomas. You saw and you believed. But there's a blessing for those that are able to believe without seeing. If you and I are to believe this morning, it actually won't be the way that Thomas believed. And that's a good thing because there's a blessing for all of those who are able to hear and believe. And as the passage concludes, it's exactly what you and I are invited into. Because the author of the book, John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tells us why he wrote this whole narrative. He just lays it out. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. God knows, the one who inspired John to write this book, that those who are to believe are going to believe because they see that Jesus is not in the tomb and they believe that he's been raised. They are going to believe because they hear through the ears of faith Jesus speak their name and they will realize they belong to him. They will believe not by seeing him and that will be a blessing. They will believe and have life in his name forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And so today, let me plead with you, don't look to the things that are seen. Let me read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Verse 18, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Let me encourage you instead to hear this message that resounds through the ages and will ever be true. Jesus is alive. He is risen. The message that resounded the morning that he got up from the grave has resounded ever since and will be our theme in glory forever and ever throughout endless ages. Jesus is alive. Believe and have life in his name. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we believe, we believe that Jesus is alive. Thank you that we have heard and that we believe and that we have life in his name. All this we pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. As we conclude our service, let's stand. Let's hear the blessing that comes from the living God. The blessing that will leave with us and rest with us. And let's, let's finish our time together by singing praise to our risen Savior. So hear this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid crown, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of and his presence today. Amen.